Chapter 8 is essentially a continuation of Chapter 7, and we're going to look at what are called advanced theories of covalent bonding. So it's just bringing in a few more ideas, uh, but they're all re relevant to Lewis structures. At the end of this chapter, we're going to look at something briefly called molecular orbital theory, which is kind of the next step beyond Lewis theory. But at the beginning of the chapter, for most of the sections, um, you can figure these things out based on the Lewis structure. So here we're going to do what we often do. We're going to look at what some of these theories mean and then how to practically apply them. So we have already talked about this, but I just want to um, review briefly. So in this case, we're going to go kind of in this direction. So we start off with these two hydrogens that are relatively far apart. And they, they basically have no interaction with each other. Then they start to move closer together. And the nuclei of this one it tends to um, attract the electrons of this one. And they share those electrons so they can be noble gas-like, in this case, like helium. So as they move closer and closer together, there's a stronger interaction. And then they're going down on this hill. And then essentially, you find this uh, good distance. Uh, where you have this covalent bond and you have the lowest energy and this is the most stable form of hydrogen. If you were to try to squeeze them closer together, you'd be putting the two protons too close together and then that wouldn't be um, a favorable situation. So basically, we've looked at this before, but this explains what a covalent bond is. And it's important to note that having electron density between the two atoms is very beneficial because it's attracted to both this nucleus and this nucleus. And that is a beneficial situation, and it's what makes these atoms helium-like, um, helium and it's why they share them. Now, of course, hydrogen is much more reactive than helium, so it's not perfect, but it's better than an H and an H separate. So this is more stable than this situation. So let's look at the two different types of bonds that can occur. And in this section, we're going to talk about the two types of bonds. In the next section, we're going to talk about something called hybridization. And then we're going to come back to this bonding um, after we've covered hybridization. It's one of those things where it's very difficult uh, to decide which one you want to talk about first, sigma and pi bonds, or hybridization, because you need to know something about both of them to understand the other. But anyway, here we have a sigma bond. And A is a sigma bond. This is a bond that occurs from the overlap of orbitals between two atoms. And this is a beneficial situation. The reason that this is a beneficial situation is because the electron density is now shared between this nuclei and this nuclei. It would not be as beneficial for them to share in this like B case. Because there's less overlap between the orbitals, these electrons aren't as close as possible to both nuclei. So this is basically what a sigma bond is. And a sigma bond is very important because when you form a covalent bond, there's always a sigma bond occurring between the two nuclei. And that's the most favorable bond, so that's the one that occurs first. Now, if you were to look at some different types of orbitals in sigma bonds, here's a sigma bond between two s orbitals. Here's a sigma bond between an s orbital and a p orbital. And here's a sigma bond between two p orbitals that you've seen before. Now, it turns out that these orbitals are going to hybridize, as we'll talk about in the next section. And um, we'll take a look at what that looks like. But what's important to remember here is that a sigma bond occurs between two atoms. A pi bond, on the other hand, occurs above and below the plane of the atom. And you may say, well, why would there be a pi bond? That doesn't look very stable. It's not between the two atoms. It's not as stable as possible. And the reason is that a pi bond only forms if a sigma bond has already formed. So if there's already electron density between the two atoms, here shown in this white color between these two atoms, then you could form a pi bond above and below the atom by the, the overlap of, in this case, p orbitals. The reason that a pi bond forms is because the electron density is already between the two atoms, or said another, another way, there, are, there already is a sigma bond. So if you were to have a double bond, for example, you would have a sigma bond, not shown here, between the two atoms, and a pi bond above and below. And if you were to have a triple bond, you would have one sigma bond and two pi bonds. You can't have more than one sig sigma bond for the 
reason that once this space is occupied with electrons, you can't put any more electrons in there. So the only other place to put them is above and below the plane of the atom. And we'll talk about that more in a little while. So in this section, we're talking about the theory of sigma and pi bonds. In the next section, we'll talk about hybridization. And then we're going to combine the two ideas and come back and talk about um, sigma and pi bonds in actual atoms in the third section. And in that section, we'll look at some of the practical aspects, like figuring out how many sigma and pi bonds a molecule has.